<laughs> Welcome everyone to DTR. Uh, we've got a really great lineup to you today on, on March 29th, the very last of our edition of the spring 2022 semester. My name is Michelle Zaldivar. I'm your program coordinator over at the Office of Global Learning Initiatives. If you haven't already, please make sure to take a second to sign in. The QR code right up there is where you can log in your information, especially if you are a Global Learning Medallion student or here to claim credit for a course that you're taking. That's the way that I can confirm your attendance, but you can also screenshot the very last confirmation page and you can use that for whatever reporting strategy you have to get your points through. To read today's article, you can go to go.fiu.edu slash ttrmar29, a very special article literally pulled from the archives of the New York Times because what we're gonna talk about today, I swear to you, is straight out of sci-fi. And I'm so excited for it. So today's topic is, correct me if I say this wrong, virtual tableau. Virtual. 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 Tabadul. Tabadul. Zul with like a... Did I do that correctly? Like a Again. Zul in there? Yeah. Like a TH? Tabazul, beautiful. Like Tabazul. Creating real international relationships through virtual exchange in virtual reality. Um, we have Stephanie Dosher here with us today, who I'm going to introduce and, and give you a little more information about. But before we do, a couple of student-facing announcements. If you're a Medallion student, remember, log your attendance so you can get your points. If you want to learn more about the Excellence in Global Learning Medallion or any of our other programs, including PC Prep and Millennium Fellowship, please feel free to hang out after the uh, session. Ask me, Michelle, or Sherry Beeson, our program manager. Um, for some of those questions. We also have some GL peer advisors sitting in the front, so special shout out to them, Melanie Perez and Bridget. Bridget, are you hiding somewhere? She's still in the front. Those are the two people you met on their way in and they have done an absolutely fabulous job for the last couple of sessions greeting you guys and getting that information out to you, so thank you very much. You can also email glmetal at fiu.edu for some more information. We've got two really big programs coming up soon. So already open are the applications for the Global Learning Student Fellowship, all sorts of programming, including funding for any kind of engagement or research project that you might want to engage in in the 2022-2023 in the school year. So if you are still gonna be here next school year and you want to apply and learn more about that fellowship, applications are open at go.fiu.edu slash glfellowapp. Or again, email glmetal at uh, fiu.edu and we can get you some more information. The other big event that we've got going on is the third installment of our The Russian Invasion of Ukraine series. This one will be a purely a Q&A. So our last session, which was on the global implications of the invasion, had so many questions that we are isolating an entire session just to address some of those and more from the audience that comes for that session. That's going to happen on April 6th at 4 p.m. and that will be fully online. You can reserve your seat to RSVP at go.fiu.edu slash Ukraine. To read this article, uh, oh, thanks. It's, it is. It's been great. It really has been great, and it's gotten great feedback. Uh, so highly encourage you to go. So if you've gone to go.fiu.edu slash ttrmar29 and you hit that paywall, that means that you still haven't accessed your free New York Times digital subscription. If you haven't done that yet, you can get that at accessnyt.com. This is because TTR is done in partnership with the New York Times. They give us free digital subscriptions to our FIU community. So anyone with an at fiu.edu email address can get a free digital subscription. Again, that is accessnyt.com. Com. And on to the main event, because sitting here next to me is Ms. Stephanie Dosher, Director of Florida International University's Office of Collaborative Online International Learning, COIL. FIU COIL is how you're going to hear that referred. She is co-author of Making Global Learning Universal, Promoting Inclusion and Success for All Students, and contributing editor of the Guide to COIL Virtual Exchange, Comprehensive Handbooks for Engaging All Undergraduates in Collaborative Global Problem Solving with Diverse Others. If this sounds familiar to you, that's because Stephanie, and Ms. Dr. Dosher, was integral in developing how we see global learning here at FIU, and she continues that work through global and beyond. She hosts the Making Global Learning Universal podcast, which you can check out at globallearningpodcast.fiu.edu. 
is a faculty fellow with FIU's Center for Leadership and serves on the editorial advisory board for AAC and U's Liberal Education. I'm gonna hand it over to Stephanie because she's going to introduce the rest of this marvelous panel that we've got coming in uh, live in front of us and some people on Zoom joining us internationally. Stephanie? Thank you, Michelle, and thank you to um, the whole Office of Global Learning Initiatives staff, um, and especially to this all-star lineup joining us here in 3D and on Zoom. So um, I'll just introduce a little bit about um, the office that I'm leading right now because I guess it is important for the birth of this project. Just the birth part, that's all. <laughs> um, the Office of Global Learning Initiatives had a baby, and it's called FIU COIL. Um, the office that I lead now is all about matching teachers. It starts with matching teachers, matching faculty faculty who teach in different institutions, in different countries, maybe in different languages, maybe in different disciplines, and they get together and they create a project that their students will work on using common communication technology for usually like four weeks to eight weeks. It's called coiling, and it's really cool because you get to make a relationship. You get to make a friendship through the process of working on a project together with someone that you might never have the opportunity to meet if the only way to connect was by getting on a plane. Yeah? So with COIL, we believe in connecting at all costs and under any circumstances. And once you get into that connecting mindset, you start seeing connections everywhere. And, and that's where this whole story of virtual tabado begins. So one of my oldest, dearest friends and colleagues at FIU is Dr. Melissa Baral. She's the first person who's going to talk to you today because she's really the baby mama <laughs> A virtual tabato. <laughs> she heard about COIL, and she heard about a really big grant available from an organization called the Stevens Initiative. The Stevens Initiative, it's named after Ambassador Chris Stevens, who was killed in Benghazi, Libya. He was also a person who believed in connecting at all costs. Yeah with the people that he served as ambassador. But he was killed and his family and friends made a foundation in his honor that supports connecting US students and students in the Middle East and North, Af North Africa using virtual exchange. So Melissa heard about COIL, this connecting thing. She heard about the money <laughs> that could support another connection connecting language and culture learning and technology. What would it be like if students could meet in virtual reality spaces and have conversations in English and in Arabic and learn about each other and make friends and like have fun? <laughs> you know, that's really what it's about. And so she put it all together into this really cool grant proposal. And we got it! <laughs> and that was, yay! <laughs> and so now we're gonna tell you the story of what this whole thing is about. I will quit talking and the people that are making this happen are gonna talk. So first let's turn it over to Melissa, um, who is joining us on Zoom. And she's gonna explain what Virtual Tabadul is all about, in fact, Noah and I, Noah is a graduate assistant working on this um, work, a PhD student in um, our School of Education. We're gonna pretend that we're in the US and somewhere else in the world, in Morocco or Algeria. Melissa. 
Thank you so much, Stephanie. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Professor Baralt, Melissa, and I'm the project director. I'm just so grateful to be here today and especially so humbled to be with this amazing team. So the people that you see here on Zoom, um, the people that you see there in person, just being part of this virtual Tabadil family and what I learn from each of you every day, I'm so honored, truly. Um, so what I want to tell you about very briefly is what is virtual Tabadul? What do students do and what are they meant to learn? So I'm a psycholinguist here at FIU. Psycholinguistics really is the study of all the cognitive aspects involved when adults learn another language. And virtual Tabadul, virtual Tabadul, the Tabadul means exchange in Arabic, so it literally means virtual exchange is to give you a definition of virtual reality environment and language learning community that our team is creating. And in my, my field, the field of psycholinguistics, one of the greatest mysteries is why is it that some people are just amazing at learning another language, but other people have the hardest time. It's so difficult for them to learn a foreign language. So one of the jobs of my field is to come up with new ways or methods or interventions to help adults acquire a second or foreign language at their best ability. And so where this came about was I had done a COIL workshop from Stephanie. I learned it, about it from her, learned how to do it. And I also, reading all of the literature on psycholinguistics, there's a new theory that says that when students socially interact in virtual reality spaces where they're actually immersed in a, a real environment and they can interact with objects and people and they can integrate visual spatial information while they learn the language, that that might actually be better, more effective than traditional grammar-based classroom method of learning another language. So we're actually testing this hypothesis. Um, and this is really important for a language like Arabic, which the United States government classifies as a category four language or an exceptionally difficult language to learn. So what if learning Arabic in a virtual reality space could improve the language learning experience and make it that much more effective? So. All of the team that you see here, we are creating virtual reality scenes that represent everyday spaces in the United States and North Africa and Middle East or the uh, MENA region. So examples might be an outdoor market, um, a restaurant, um, a bakery in Dearborn, Michigan, a university classroom. And I'd like to show you one now that, that we created. Um, I'm going to see if I can, let's see, share my screen here. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, this is a scene in Timgad, Algeria, and it's actually thanks to Professor Abdel Haq will be speaking in a little bit. He um, greatly facilitated creating this space. So this space is a real space in Algeria. Um, this is the largest Roman ruins in the world. And so now I want to talk really quickly about what it is that students do and then um, Stephanie and Noha will model for you the actual virtual Tabadul experience. So what do students do in virtual Tabadul? First, our team assigns U.S. students with a partner in either Morocco or Algeria. Student partners meet one-on-one -on -one in Zoom and they start out by doing a warm-up. We give them instructions for this in Canvas and then on Zoom they enter the real the virtual reality, um, real world scene via Google Cardboard. So this is um, what they have here, Stephanie and Noha. It's like a smartphone enabled interface that facilitates the interactive virtual reality experience. And they do this entirely with their cell phone. That was one of the objectives that the Stevens Initiative requires of our team. So students, they can move around in a bed. So this, while you can't see what Stephanie and Noha can see, this environment goes into stereoscopic mode and they, they have to move around in this embodied experience. Um, they complete real world tasks in the target language together in Arabic first then in English and they successfully have to do things like order coffee, um, order food, maybe talk about a touristic scene in their home community. As part of the task, they have to go through the virtual reality scene and find clues. So as you guys can see here, here's the first clue and the way that you um, activate it, you have to hover over it with, with the virtual reality scene embedded and I'll show it to you, I'll play it for you here. 
And there's, of course, um, Professor. Assalamu alaikum. Hi, everyone. And a taliba is So I'll look out of that. That's some of the clues might be videos of actual students there in Algeria. Here's another one. There's, there's Dr. Namuji himself, who you'll hear in a second. That's another clue. He might describe something. Here's a different one. Some of the clues are audio based. And as you can see, as students go through and find these clues, a little ribbon of having accomplished finding that clue appears at the top. Um, so a sample task that students might do in this scene is they go around and find the rest of the Susan. Again, you have to move your body. Um, they have to talk about linguistic diversity in their community and what it looks like. What does that mean for them? And again, it's all in the, the target languages. And I'll see if I can find the fifth one. I know there it is. Okay. This one shows the name Tim God in three languages. Um, and so that really speaks to the linguistic diversity component of this sample task. So that's what students do. And we're creating 12 of these virtual reality scenes. Finally, what is it that students are meant to learn? Um, the goal for you as students is to learn and practice Arabic. And then for MENA region, Middle East and North Africa region students, is to learn and practice English. They're also acquiring global and cultural competency and most importantly, friendship. They are being assessed in linguistic measures, fluency measures, um, global residence measures, and also they're creating learning portfolios that actually demonstrate the real world tasks that they do together. And with no further ado, I will stop sharing and pass it on to the next person. Most importantly is that through virtual tabadul, these young people can meet um, irrespective of the being so remote and socially distant consistent uh, conditions and actually practice collaborating in real world tasks. And our team is the very first in the world to do this in virtual reality for specifically Arabic foreign language learning. So cool. Thank you. You're getting some claps in the audience, by the way. <laughs> so we're introducing each person on this team as they speak because we're kind of going in the same order in terms of how we connected with people to build this project and make it a reality. So we could not do this without teachers, professors of English in Algeria and Morocco and professors of Arabic in the United States. So now we're going to get a chance to meet these four pioneering professors. So the first person that we connected with was the Arabic professor here at FIU. Yay, you got it. <laughs> you, he's got some fans. <laughs> um, Dr. Jamil Estefan. And Professor Estefan, the question for you is, why were you interested in doing this? You could teach just the way you always teach. Why would you take such a chance on a project like this? Yes, uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, it's uh, so I'm so happy to see you all, see some of my students. I know this is the interference of uh, our class hours. And thanks for coming anyway and joining us. So I probably, um, we can put the, the video later on as the gentleman here promised, uh, like within a couple of days uh, on YouTube and we can watch it all. It's a very interesting and very exciting moment uh, to me uh, to join this uh, professional uh, panel. Um, as Stephanie and Melissa mentioned that uh, Tabadul is really the birth of coil, really without coil, we couldn't make it. Uh, I, I see like coil is the father of this uh, project and uh, she is the mother. <laughs> <laughs> we all went through uh, some uh, courses and some uh, uh, professionalism uh, uh, in coil. We took some courses and uh, for a couple months, right? Mm -hmm. And it's been uh, a tool for us to manage this uh, new project, which is uh, 
again, this is the, the birth of the pandemic, you know. Within the pandemic, we uh, discover a new time change. This is the time change, a game change, I call it. Uh, we learn a lot through Zoom, through the hyper uh, classes. So it's up to us to choose which technology we can manage. So since we believe in the approach of people between Algeria and Morocco, between Ukraine and Russia, we, since we believe in humanity and peaceful, so we have to understand each other culture. And we went through this uh, project, uh, Tabadol, which I really believe this is the epitome of education. Uh, pretty much is about implementing this uh, uh, experiment in classes. As I'm uh, the professor of the Arabic classes, I have to go through and encourage uh, and stimulate uh, our students and contacting and uh, uh, interchange some uh, culture. We live with culture, we don't live with language only. Language is not enough. Without culture, there is no language, believe me. And if we understand each other, recently I was reading uh, the story about uh, J.F. Kennedy, you know, I don't know if I share it with my classes. The, the story of Ein Berliner and Berliner, the donuts. Uh, I mean, it's good to know, and it's good to understand the other people culture to make a peaceful life. And in the meantime, we are developing, we are progressing, and we are mastering and excelling our language. Why? We give you what we have, and you give us what you have as well. This is what is a battle. The battle is interchange, exchange. Okay? I take from you some culture. I learn from you some Arabic expressions. You learn from me some English one. And beyond that, uh, we can uh, make and we can construct a, a new conversation and a new, a new relationship, international ship. I always used to say and repeat the expression, Go Panthers, go international. This is FIU, Florida International University. Thank you. It, yeah, so this is what hap has been happening over and over. We are through virtual tabado, the, those of us who are working on it, we're, we're, we're getting to peel back the layers of perspective and learn things that we didn't know before about people. It, 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 Jamil, your passion, we, we don't think as students sometimes that our teachers have this kind of passion because we don't necessarily see it. But I'm telling you, I get to see it. <laughs> Another thing that many of us don't know is that the United States is home to many, many people from the Middle East and North African region and descent. And the place where many, many of these people live happen to be a very large population of um, Arabic peoples is in Michigan, specifically in Dearborn, Michigan, which is also the home of the Ford Motor Company where Henry Ford lived. Yeah, <laughs> you can see. So we needed more Arabic learners to participate in virtual tabadul. So we went to our friends in Michigan at the University of Deer, uh, Michigan Dearborn campus. And Professor Wassam al Maligi is a professor of um, Arabic at that campus. And he's going to tell us a little bit about his campus and why, why is it so important for people of Arabic descent to learn Arabic in your community? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Stephanie, and thank you, everybody. It's, it's, it's great to join you. Um, I'll try to be brief. Uh, uh, before I introduce, I have like uh, some visual uh, visuals that I would like to uh, to use uh, uh, to introduce Dearborn and introduce University of Michigan Dearborn. Uh, but I'll, I'll just say one thing that and uh, Melissa, as a linguist, uh, would definitely uh, corroborate that um, Arabic has um, a linguistic feature uh, known as diglossia. For those of you who have studied uh, linguistics or into language studying would be familiar with this. And uh, 
briefly, uh, in like uh, non-technical terms, diglossia would be uh, an linguistic feature or a feature in a language where you would have a standard form of the language, but you would also have several dialects that are uh, as overwhelming and also as uh, important and as primary, used as primary um, languages. And they're almost, uh, an, each, each dialect is almost a language in its own right. Uh, so Arab countries, or what we would refer to as the Arab world, has so many countries stretching uh, over uh, two continents. So you would have a number of dialects, like uh, Egyptian dialect, I'm originally from Egypt, um, uh, Algerian, uh, Moroccan, uh, Tunisian, have Iraqi. Uh, in Gulf countries, you would have uh, dialects as well. Of course, you have Lebanese uh, and Syrian, and even uh, what in a lot of books teaching Arabic uh, as a foreign language or what we refer to as Tafel or a second language would group them into only Egyptian, uh, Levantine, uh, North African, Iraqi and so on. But even within those, you would still have uh, dialects as well. And But at the same time, people who speak Arabic from all those countries uh, have to learn formally at school uh, standard Arabic, what we refer to as MSA or modern standard Arabic, which is a modern derivative of classical Arabic. Uh, and in that sense, almost everyone who speaks Arabic actually almost speaks two languages rather than one. They are very much related, they are very close to each other, but essentially you speak two languages. I mean, since I came here uh, to Dearborn, uh, I'm beginning to actually speak three languages because I'm speaking a lot of Lebanese, <laughs> because Dearborn is, uh, ha is, uh, has a very strong uh, Lebanese community. When I was growing up uh, in Egypt, I also traveled with my father uh, to a number of Arab countries, in, in, including Morocco, where I went to school for the first time. I'm Egyptian, but I was born in Beirut. Uh, we also went to uh, other countries like Libya, uh, and we went to uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. So I've, I've picked sort of dialects, and it's amazing. And coming over to Dearborn, uh, and this is where I start to share my screen, uh, you get uh, not just an Arab community or an Arab-American community, but it's uh, Arabs in the sense, or Arabics, if you can use that, or if you can as yes, because you uh, have a, a strong community of uh, uh, Arabs of Lebanese descent, of uh, uh, Syrian descent, Iraqi, Yemeni descent, and uh, 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 more and more of other countries as well, um, uh, Moroccan and Algerian, and, uh, but Moroccan and Algerian in particular uh, are, not, are less represented in uh, Dearborn, and this is where the virtual tabata comes in, because our students over here, many of them, uh, have not traveled or had uh, study abroad opportunities into Arabic-speaking countries. And many of them are content in the fact that they are Arab heritage learners, and therefore, uh, I mean, why sort of, why do we need that? But when they uh, have the opportunity to learn Arabic as a standard Arabic, and then have the opportunity to interact um, with uh, Arabic speakers from Algeria and Morocco, for instance, uh, this becomes, a, a surprisingly, a very unique cultural experience for them. They are not uh, learning a new or a foreign language, they are learning a familiar language, but they're, and they're also talking to people from uh, Arabic speaking countries, uh, and they can always sort of share that with their parents. And I can tell you parents are very excited about those kinds of opportunity in particular, like uh, anyone who has been to an Arab country or anyone who's Arab descent knows how uh, Arab parents uh, drive hard uh, their, their sons and daughters to, uh, to study uh, Arabic language and Arabic heritage and to study in general. And it's, it's amazing how Arabic is doing well over here in spite of the push for uh, STEM or like engineering, mathematics and so on. So they have a humanities or social sciences uh, uh, discipline is really interesting. Let me talk for the next few minutes uh, about Dearborn <coughs> and I'm sure I don't know. Uh, can you all see it? Yeah, we can't see now. He's trying to share his. Uh... Yeah, he's trying to share the screen. Oh, did he come? Did he? I think he might have gotten cut off. Yeah. Uh, can Can you see me now? I think I was. Yeah, uh, it's probably a connection issue. Yeah. Can you see me and hear me now, or can you see the like the presentation? We the can screen? see and hear you, but we can't see the. What the presentation? Okay, let me uh, let me share again. Maybe when I was disconnected, something happened. Okay, um, you can keep going. Yeah, Michelle is. Go oh, we got it. Look at that. You got it? Okay. Beautiful. Awesome. 
All right. Uh, so Dearborn is referred to as a hub of Arab culture in the United States. Uh, I mean, uh, sometimes we're presumptuous over here and we say it's the capital of Arab culture in the United States. But it really is uh, uh, the one city with more uh, a bigger population of uh, Arabic speakers anywhere outside uh, Arab countries, which is which is amazing. Uh, so, I mean, any country that is not an Arab country has does not have the same number of people speaking Arabic as Dearborn. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, welcome to Dearborn. Let's go over uh, quickly a few slides introducing it. So Dearborn is home of the Arab American National Museum, which is the only uh, national museum in the United States or in the nation of its kind, dedicated to Arab culture and to Arab American culture in particular. <clears throat> uh, Arabic is so prevalent over here that uh, many signs, street signs and so on are translated into Arabic or written in English and Arabic. And this is something that you have a lot in the United States. Uh, or many cities where if you have a community that does not speak English and is uh, predominant, uh, then many signs are translated into that language. <clears throat> um, there are a number of Islamic centers and mosques uh, in, uh, in Dearborn, like this one. Uh, Ramadan is approaching. Happy Ramadan to everyone who observes it. Uh, and um, uh, it's very easy to see and very common to see houses, uh, local homes celebrating Ramadan uh, openly, and um, this is a, a mild picture, there are other pictures, trust me, where uh, people at Iftar sit in their garage and uh, start having a meal over there and invite each other. It looks uh, the closest thing you can see to a, a, a traditional marketplace in an Arabic-speaking country. Um, uh, Dearborn elected its first uh, Arab-American mayor ever, which is a sign of uh, the push for or the increasing influence of the population over here. Uh, there are lots of activists in Dearborn, uh, the census, for instance, it has been a lot of activism in uh, introducing Arab uh, as uh, uh, a race or as uh, uh, an entity or an item in census instead of including Arab as uh, part of white. And this, of course, would uh, uh, increase uh, political and economic opportunities for Arabic speakers or uh, U.S. citizens of Arab origin or Arab heritage. As you can see over here, there are so many local businesses. Shatila is one of them. Um, that we mentioned earlier, you have like uh, supermarkets, you have pharmacies, uh, I mean, and the uh, delicious uh, eateries of Middle Eastern and Arab uh, food. And then this is my campus or my university, the University of Michigan Dearborn. The University of Michigan has three campuses, one in Ann Arbor, one in Dearborn, and one at Flint. And uh, this is uh, our Dearborn campus. This is not related to Arabic, but I just love uh, the—I uh, mean, love the way it looks. So I, I, I put it in there. <laughs> um, a couple more slides, and then I'll stop. Uh, I mean, uh, the University of Michigan Dearborn encourages a lot of research, as you can see over here. This is a colleague of mine called Hani Boradi, who did a research preserving Arab American stories, uh, and um, in um, in the Center of Arab American Studies over here. Uh, those are two. Uh, Certificates that I introduced, and I'm directing one on Arabic translation and another certificate on comparative literature certificate. And those would not have been possible to have in, uh, in other campuses without the interest and uh, encouragement and support of the Arab uh, speaking community over here. Um, the certificate, for instance, has like written translation, interpreting, which is simultaneous interpreting for conferences, it has subtitling, uh, subtitling of movies and films. Um, and uh, like Arabic novels and short stories, and so many courses over here. Now, the last couple of slides, uh, uh, we have a lot of organizations and uh, communities and centers, like the Center for Arab American Studies, the Arab American Center for Culture and Arts and Access, uh, which is uh, the, uh, for economic and social developments. Uh, we have a very vibrant cultural scene over here. I mean, uh, I put pictures of uh, myself mainly because where else would you find two Sams talking to each other? Like there is, if you see the picture over here, you have, I mean, I, I grew up, my name is, uh, is mainly it's more Lebanese than Egyptian. So I grew up never hearing anyone or speaking <laughs> anyone called Wissam. The first week I came over here, yeah. uh, uh, I met something like five people sharing the same name, which is, which is amazing. Um, okay, uh, this is it. Uh, I'm sorry if I took too much time. I'd be happy uh, to see everybody. Thank you so much for, uh, for having you, me. I'm Sam. very excited about this. We're Thank very, you. we're, it, it's amazing to, to learn about another city in the United States that like Miami, where there is another um, culture that is so strong, where it feels like you're in, in another country almost. So exactly. 
so we're doing okay on time because we have a couple of people that weren't able to join us today. But now, okay, we cannot do virtual tabadul without our partners in the Middle East and North Africa. So next speaking with us is Dr. Abdelhaq Namuchi. Dr. Abdelhaq is in Algeria drinking mm -hmm. his tea, which he says is something good for digestion. <laughs> and <laughs> Dr. Dr. Abdelhaq, would you share with us why were you willing to take a chance on doing virtual tabadul? Oh, yes. Uh, actually, it was a great opportunity that I could not miss. Uh, why uh, I was interested in virtual tabadul. In fact, there uh, are plenty of reasons. Uh, I, I would start saying that as an EFL teacher for a very long period of time, I have always dreamed of placing my learners in an authentic communicative setting, uh, a setting made up of native speakers, you know, evolving in the real world. In the absence of material means to send my students in this context, there was only technology left to create this authenticity without having the learners try travel abroad. <clears throat> Sorry. In other words, what convinced me to take part in the other project was the, th the search for a cross or a marriage between authenticity as it has always been advocated by modern teaching approaches with technology. <clears throat> All the literature revolving around technology in language teaching is unanimous to assert its usefulness and effectiveness in mastering the target language. If authenticity has asserted its role in the process of learning a foreign language, what would be the contribution of technology, if not that of bringing learners closer to real or virtual scenes as much as possible? Yes. All of us know that the objective of Tebedul is to establish uh, an exchange between learners from various horizons to meet in a virtual world to communicate freely on previously studied themes, and let me insist on previously studied themes, because one, one may wonder why these students are not left to communicate freely through social media. Now, through social media, the themes are not studied scientifically. So on previously studied themes in order to learn a foreign language and discover the other's culture that sustains it. And this leads me to recall that the strength of Tebedo lies in the objective of a double linguistic and cultural enrichment. And that was really fabulous. But regarding the cultural aspect, my students know of the United States, you know, only what the media and Hollywood wanted to show them. Compensating for this lack with a trip to the United States is an extremely rare opportunity that than 100% of my students we have you know, wandering in the streets of Miami and asking questions to natives about their daily life is an activity that only Tebedo has offered. And that was another reason for me to embark on the project. Moreover, my interest in Tebedo increased when I saw the distress of my students in the English department at Milbuere University, where I teach, who well, have never been in contact with native speakers of English and who know about American culture only what the official programs teach them. Tabedo responded to this euphoria of the learners to establish contact with American partners in a strongly academic context and to exchange with them on topics likely to help them progress in the language they are learning. Today, after a year of preparation and implementation of Tabedo, I see the enormous enthusiasm of Amil Buwari University participants to exchange with American partners learning Arabic. Since the exchange between the students started, I could observe and measure their excitement and their availability to learn and to contribute to learning. They learn and contribute to learning because we are the these are in fact two target languages, not only one. This highly hopeful reaction of Algerian learners, if shared by American partners, may encourage us to consider some other types of tabadul over several years in different scientific research domains. I, if I had to caricature the novel role of tabadul, I would give it the form of an academic bridge made up of languages and cultures 
spanning over the torrents of political discourse. My final word is the expression of my warmest thanks to the whole Tabadil team under the le leadership of Stephanie, Melissa, and Lachter, and to congratulate them for showing great patience. Thank you to our team. Oh, oh. I know, it's like poetry. It's like listening to poetry. <laughs> These professors are like amazing. Yosef, mm. you are coming to us from Morocco, a very different context than Algeria, than Egypt, than the US. Um, learning English is of strategic importance uh, in the Middle East and North Africa region. But we don't necessarily realize how important this language is and the reasons why. Um, could you share with us your observations of why it is important for your students to learn English and for even your nation and your region? Oh, I think you are on mute, my friend. Oh, no, come in. Oh, oh there you go. Now you're there. Yeah, okay, good, sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks, uh, Stephanie. Thanks to the uh, Global uh, Initiative Learning. Thanks to all the organizing committee. This is a good opportunity to share some ideas and also to listen to colleagues and learn from, from them. Well, I think uh, learning English, I th first of all, I would like to say a few words just about the choice of the two languages, Arabic and English. Uh, these are two of the most spoken, you know, languages in the world, and two, again, of the fifth or sixth languages of the United Nations. So, um, uh, learn, uh, as you know, the MENA region, I think we can divide it into two sub-regions, you know. We have North Africa and we have Middle East. So, English for uh, Gulf countries and, and for Egypt as well is... Uh, a second language, but in North Africa, it, it's a foreign language. But I'm sure that in a few years, English uh, will be, again, a second language in Morocco. So why are North African countries and also Middle East uh, countries interested in learning English? So there are so many reasons, but I'll keep myself to two main reasons. One has to do with the economy. Uh, I will take the case of more. Uh, one has to do with the economy. Second one has to do with education and scientific research itself. So as far as the economy is concerned, the first free trade agreement to be signed, you know, with a foreign country, you know, in Morocco is with the United States of America. So a lot of, uh, you know, multinational American uh, companies uh, moved to Casablanca, to Tangier, and of course, the workforce uh, is Moroccan. And for these people to communicate with their American partners or with other partners from European countries, uh, so uh, English is, is the key. Uh, and again, uh, to facilitate the transfer of the technological know-how, as you know, you may be Japanese, you may be Chinese, but if you want to work, I mean, uh, you need to write this into English. Think of manuals, think of uh, users' books, and so on. So that's why English is 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 a must. Uh, and now uh, the government here in Morocco has launched a lot of programs where they help companies. I mean, the employees of companies learn English. And when it comes to tuition fees, 80% is paid by the government. So which means companies pay just 20%. So this is a very good initiative by the government because now we, uh, I mean, we are sure that for us to, uh, as an emerging economy, to access to technology, to uh, knowledge. So we need to teach and learn English. Again, as you know, Morocco is a tourist destination. So uh, English for specific purposes uh, uh, is, is something that a lot of people, not only in hospitality industry learn, but uh, we have, I mean, other industries. So where people should learn English, because English, 
as you may know, is the lingua franca. Again, wherever you go around the world, people speak English. So this is the first reason. Uh, and, and I'm happy that English is gaining this, this, this position because, as you know, English is not a Mediterranean language. It is not. So, but now it's becoming. Uh, okay, it's being used as a lingua franca, but I'm sure it will be a second language as subject. Now, the second reason is has to do with education. Now, uh, 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 the National Charter of Education and Training, which was launched by the government in 2003 to introduce reforms in the education system, insisted on the fact that students in Moroccan schools or universities should learn English. Now, we do teach English in primary schools. Uh, my daughter is in the third grade and she started learning English. So this is a significant change. Uh, also, just to give you an idea, our ministry has changed its name. Now it's, it's called its Ministry of Higher Education, Training and Innovation. And of course, uh, uh, the government has, they uh, uh, say, um, uh, decided to uh, finance scientific research. And of course now, even uh, for a, a researcher to uh, to defend their uh, PhD, for example, degree, they should present a certificate, you know, that they are, uh, uh, that, they, that they can speak English and know English. So I think English is, is a strategic choice for Morocco because this is how we can improve scientific research and also uh, help transfer the technological know-how which basically uh, comes from the United States or from other English-speaking countries. So I think uh, I have answered your question. Thank you again for this initiative. Uh, and uh, by the way, just to, uh, since this program is funded by the Department of State, so just today, uh, your, your, your Secretary of State is here in Morocco. <gasps> Oh, uh, yay. <laughs> and, and you see, and even our ministers now have to study English, you know, if they have to communicate with, uh, with allies and uh, so on. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, Professor. Thank you. So um, we could not do this without technology. And this entire project is meant to further the research that we do in language and linguistics and education. Um, we have two more speakers to hear from today um, in, in the moments that we have left for, from us. We have um, <laughs> Biana Bogosian, who directs our robotics. I, I, you're going to have to give me the whole, you're going to have to say the name of the lab. But this woman is a wizard. <laughs> She is a technology wizard. Um, and virtual reality and what we're doing with it is amazing, but there's even more I know on the horizon. If you could share a little bit about your role in the lab, um, anything that you would like to share with us about the technology, and maybe even what you think is next, coming next down the road. Sure, thank you so much. Hope you can see or hear me okay. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to be part of the team and have been working with you this past uh, year and looking uh, forward to ahead. So I'm an assistant professor of architectural technology uh, at FIU School of Architecture. Uh, and I'm affiliated with uh, FIU Institute of Environment, and I'm an assistant director of our robotics and digital fabrication lab. Uh, all of this is to say maybe what does that have to do with language? And so I just want to give you um, maybe an overview of what all of this means. Uh, in architecture, um, especially with my background in media arts, the goal is to communicate um, information through representation. Uh, and definitely there's perhaps building and build environment component, but in our lab, we focus on how immersive media such as virtual and augmented reality could help us in teaching a um, new way of communication, whether that's through robotics for environmental factors, or in this case, collaboration with um, this wonderful team on teaching language. Um, my background is um, also quite um, 
maybe connected to uh, the interest here. I'm Armenian, but born and raised in Iran. And so, so I learned Arabic as a uh, second language and um, uh, in, um, in middle school and high school. So for me, it's been interesting to go back to this. In terms of uh, role of technology, currently um, virtual reality, which is on the branch of immersive media, uh, is very much dependent on um, expensive headsets and technology for communication. However, in the past um, few years, with the advent of more advanced um, hardware and software, we're able to begin to look at ways that this technology become more ubiquitous so more people could access this. So for us, collaboration with, uh, on this project was really important in terms of really thinking about how the type of technology that we're working with could potentially scale up. Uh, in a research and research R&D settings, often we do demos and prototypes for really thinking about developing a technology that could withstand um, over 1,000 user testing and a few years of development is really, really important. So not only um, this project is looking at um, communicating curriculum through um, user interface and user experience that's using audio visual cues, but we're also um, doing a novel contribution when it comes to number of people that we're reaching. And this is really important. Um, one other aspect is importance of audio. So usually with immersive media, uh, you very much rely on design of the environment and visual cues to communicate, but with language learning and teaching, um, we really have to think about audio and video as an important way of communication. So that's been a really eye-opening um, way of discussing with the team when we begin to use audio, maybe as a background noise. Sometimes we think about coupling different languages when expressing so it's been really, um, really wonderful. So also working on papers with you. So I really hope to um, break more uh, boundaries with you. And the last thing is importance of interdisciplinary research. Just like my background is, um, is sometimes difficult to express and maybe the type of work that we do and collaborations around FIU, but it's been really wonderful to work with um, interdisciplinary teams as you that are always thinking about relationship of technology and and humanities and arts and sciences. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Fabulous, yeah. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous. And our final comments, really thinking about the future and the kinds of research that will, and the, what we could learn from this experience that could help to further the fields of education um, Noah Elsaka, who is a PhD candidate, yes, in our School of Education. Would you share with us, what do we have to learn from this in terms of the field of education? Sure, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dasher. Okay, so mainly we are talking about the second and fourth foreign language education or acquisition, so this will pave the road through uh, the research that we are doing. So there are more opportunities to expand using virtual reality technology and learning each other languages and culture. Also, we are doing the FNIR study, which is functional near infrared spectroscopy, spectroscopy yeah. <laughs> study to examine the difference between traditional language learning and virtual reality language learning and to see the impact of the virtual reality on uh, the, l the learning of the language and also the outcomes of the students. And from another perspective, also the global citizenship. So it's a way or a step toward the global citizenship education to teach the students about their roles in the global community and the opportunities toward connecting the students with other parts of the world so they can understand the global challenges and try to take part and think of feasible solutions and actions to overcome those challenges. With that FNIR, with the FNIR study, mm -hmm. this is students will actually have their brains scanned yes. while they are doing virtual tabado yes. to see what parts of the brain are firing that might be different from traditional language learning. Exactly. Yes, we are taking brain images to see how the acquisition of the language can 
affect the brain or what will happen in the brain when we are learning another language. Uh, we do a pre-test and a post-test of a task and then we can see and compare the results between the pre-test and the post-test through the virtual reality lesson. Yes. Awesome. So it is amazing. <laughs> so we've had a lot to tell you and we took up all the time telling it to you. <laughs> But we, we hope that perhaps you might want to be more engaged with some of the things that, are, that we had to share with you today. Um, maybe you would be interested in following, I don't know if it's possible to share, uh, you'll help with that, Michelle, thank you, darling. Um, Effa, you coil on social media to see what kinds of projects you could be involved in. But more importantly, maybe you want to know more about what, about how to learn Arabic. <laughs> if you're interested in learning Arabic, you might want to come on over here and talk to your future professor so you can participate in this project. Perhaps you would like to know more about what um, Dr. Bogosian does with architecture and our robotics lab. And so you can contact us if you use this um, QR code, you can contact us, let us know what you're interested in, and we can get you interested and connected to these people and to these opportunities. Um, just thank you so much for learning with us about this incredible project, and thank you to the OGLI and the Tuesday Times Roundtable series for inviting us to share. Thank you so much for joining us. So it is in the spirit of TTR to engage more discussion. So if the panelists don't have anywhere to go and we want to hang out for a little while more, I know that the video will keep going. But it is 1.30, so my students especially, if you're like scheduling this in between, please do not feel any pressure. If you need to go, absolutely feel free to take your things. There's still some lunches out on the table, and you're more than welcome to them. Um, if you haven't already, the QR codes, I won't switch this page so that you guys can still have it, are posted around the room. So if you haven't already, please make sure to take Take a second and sign in. So if we want to hang out and if that's okay with the panelists. I can stay for yeah, can stay a couple for more a moments if folks have questions, yeah. comments. So if I so I'm gonna walk the mic over there. So I'm gonna start with a question if I can, and then I'm gonna walk over to you. And then same thing if you have a question, just so that the people on Zoom can hear you, it's gotta go directly into the mic. What's one thing that you would share with a student or researcher or collaborator that is trying to establish these international intercultural relationships either in your own experience as you yourselves have been international collaborators or in observing the students and them working together what's one piece of advice that you might share um, with someone to really effectively make those strong strong relationships yes, Michelle uh, I have a couple of my students they've been uh, through this experiment and I would love to pass the micro to them if possible so please, uh, what, all what we need is to give us your feedback from this experiment. Uh, positively or negatively, just be yourself and express your feeling about it, please, okay? Yes, of course, Professor Estefan, you know I'm always gonna be myself. Um, my name's Isabella Ford, and um, can you hear me? Sorry. Okay. Yes. Yeah, um, and I'm a first year at FIU, and um, ever since I took a trip to Egypt and Tunisia and Morocco and Jordan and Palestine, I have been in love with Arabic culture and Arabic language, and I figured out that that's, I would like to follow a career of diplomacy um, regarding the Middle East, North Africa region, so I found it essential that I immerse myself in Arabic and luckily FIU had that to offer and I got to meet my amazing professor. Um, and I just wanted to quickly like thank everybody who um, made this project you know, happen and get it into the hands of like students like myself um, because it truly is an opportunity that nothing else could ever compare to and nothing else could uh, equivalize to that. Um, I studied in school in Brazil and we didn't have computers, we didn't have sometimes textbooks, we didn't have much. And just to be a student um, and receive, you know, the like a contact in Morocco is incredible. And 
um, throughout you know, the work that I have done so far and uh, the communication that I've had with Fatima. Um, it's very exciting and it's very enriching to be able to have a conversation with someone who lives a completely different life than you do. And it's, it's not just the fact that uh, she lives in Morocco. It, it's it's completely different life, and it's a completely different culture. And um, for myself, I like to think that I already had some foundation of you know that culture and everything. But to be immersed in it is a completely different thing. And so I thank you guys, you know, so much for making this possible and for um, making those connections between your students and us. And um, so just my feedback in general is that. It's an amazing, um, it's an amazing experience. It's an amazing program. Um, I would volunteer to have my brain scanned because I want to <laughs> see, I want to see how this works. Because listen, the Duolingo bird telling me to do Arabic at 3 a.m. isn't working for me. So I want to see how, you know, how it's different um, to learn virtually and traditional ways. Um, and so, thank you for the work that you're doing for that. And my parents could probably learn Arabic doing the virtual tawadu, so uh, that says a lot, because they... Yeah, and I have a follow-up for you. So the next level of the program involvement is we have a, pro an, a program for alumni called um, Tabadul, Tabadul Atarhiba. Yeah, Atarzariba. Atarzariba. Yeah. <laughs> and it is so that you can talk to and teach future students um, how to have a successful experience. So you're the first member. <laughs> um, so I, in my humble opinion, <laughs> I think that um, what I would tell someone is um, don't, don't be afraid because I know for me, um, like I'm trilingual, and like Arabic has nothing to do with other three languages that I know. And I know for a lot of people when they learn a new language, it is very scary mm -hmm. to speak it. And I'm going to share something that happened in our classroom. Um, so Professor Istifan was teaching one day and we had learned a couple of words and went through vocabulary lists. And he, we were listening to a um, audio and it said, whatever, fi mektab al kabul. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, she works in the office in Kabul. And he looked at me, all the Arabic kids in the class were laughing, and they were like, why is she working in Afghanistan? Why is she working in Kabul? And I was like, well, you said the Mektab, which is office, Al Kabul, which is in Kabul. And he said, it is the admissions office. And that has become a joke that we make every single class. Every single class, he makes it. And I just think that that was... Honestly, yeah, it was embarrassing, but I think that that created something um, incredible. Nobody forgets what admissions office is now. I, I guarantee <laughs> it. And um, it's good. don't be afraid to mess up and make the first step of you know saying she works in the office in Kabul. Don't be afraid to make that because that's the only way you're going to learn. I, I guarantee you, nobody in that class will ever mess that up again. Mm -hmm. And so I think just be very unafraid and very fearless because this person is equally as nervous as you are. You know, I can imagine when I speak to Fatima, like, um, it's, it's, it's very frustrating, I can assume, to, you know, I have, I have the passion to learn Arabic and I'm putting the work in, but it's not as proficient as I would like it to be. And so I think my, my hardest part is not being discouraged um, that I'm not fluent after, you know, eight weeks of Arabic class. So, um, you know, just keep going on with it. I think um, consistency is the most important thing. And so I would just say, you know, be consistent. Don't be afraid. And um, the connection will happen naturally. The friendship will happen naturally. You are amazing, Isabella. Amazing. And this... Uh a joke, it wasn't a joke. This is uh, a, a mnemonic device, I call it, to learn, to remember. And we always we do that without this style of uh, making joke and making some stories and uh, uh, sharing stories and thoughts. We can never learn. And this is the reason why Tabadul is on. Any other questions? 
questions? Perspectives to share? <laughs> Problems. Yeah, keep it coming. Yalla. Um, yalla. 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 Okay, so um, I had a question actually for um, Professor Masam, possibly? Wasam? Wasam. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I forgot the name. Um, and so. Um, Hi, Thank Professor. You. My name's Isabella, Hi. but um, I just wanted to ask you a question because uh, uh, one of the first places that I lived when I moved to the United States, I'm originally from Brazil, is um, Knoxville, Tennessee. It's a very small town. It's very racist. It's very horrible. Um, and the reason that I bring this up is because Dearborn, Michigan, who, who has heard of that, you know? And so it's like we, we kind of it's a small place. What happened was I was the only kid in my entire school of 4,000 people who was born outside of the country. And um, during the Syrian refugee crisis and the Somali crisis and the Yemeni, we got an enormous influx of refugees to Knoxville, Tennessee. Oh. And my school was like, wow, Isabella, you're the only other kid that's foreign. Let's put them all with you. These kids did not speak English. I did not speak Arabic. And we learned how to communicate with each other. And since that point, they have always been my best friends. And so I was just going to ask you, um, with the large community of Arabs that you have in Dearborn, Michigan, um, I, I heard that you were saying, you know, Yemeni and Syrian. So are most of these um, students, are they, uh, refugees or you know um, families of refugees or what's the situation why is there such a huge population is what I want to know good question. Um, yeah but that, that's a good question thank you it's a uh, uh, I shared uh, many of the sentiments you shared I mean I, uh, I moved to the United States almost uh, like I don't know, 10 years ago and with with my with my family and uh, uh, the first place we went to was in Minnesota uh, which is very different from, uh, or the Twin Cities in particular, which is very different from uh, Dearborn, Michigan. So I know, uh, and my children had to go to school over there. But uh, and uh, they they already went to language schools in Egypt, which has like a strong language uh, education program, and they didn't have, uh, they didn't really need to go through any language program. Actually, they scored even higher than. Uh, um, I mean, I mean, like the highest sort of grades in language and so on, which, but again, we get all those sort of uh, comments of, uh, yeah, maybe you should take like language classes and then when they are tested, they're actually scoring uh, among the highest in the state sort of for like metrics and reading and writing and so on. But it's those like little uh, microaggressions that you get sometimes that, that really get to you. I mean, sometimes they are one intention, but, uh, and they're just based on stereotypes. So I totally understand how you feel somehow for Dearborn and Michigan in particular, it's a mix, but uh, there's a huge part of the population who are second, third, and fourth generation uh, Arab Americans because uh, uh, migration from uh, Syria and from Arabic uh, speaking countries started uh, a, a long time ago in the United States. I mean, uh, to Michigan, some of that started in the turn of the 20th century, 19th century. If you want to go earlier, I mean, and actually talk about immigrants, you can go like a couple of hundred or even 300 years. Uh, there are narratives and literary studies and ethnographic studies that trace the Arab immigration to uh, as early as pretty much like a few decades after the United States or pretty much started. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very early process. Ford in particular, the Ford uh, Motor Company uh, has been known to hire uh, Syrians in particular and other uh, Lebanese and Arab uh, speakers in Michigan. Uh, and uh, I mean, some of the, uh, well, but a lot of people say that, I mean, we have, we have been pretty much invested in the success of this company when they immigrated uh, or their families immigrated uh, generations ago. Um, uh, and, but, there are other uh, immigrants who are first generation immigrants. Uh, I'm a first generation. Uh, I'm, I moved uh, before Michigan, like I said, I was in Minnesota. Uh, and there are others. Uh, I mean, so you get two, you, you get different types of Arabic speakers over here. Those who have been here for, like, like I said, a sort of fourth generation, and those who came in as a new wave of uh, migration. Uh, many of them would be refugees in that sense. Uh, and you find all kinds of dynamics between those, those who are. I mean, consider themselves Americans, basically, uh, but those who are uh, Arabs and those who are Arab Americans, somewhere in between. And I think this is 
one of the reasons the virtual tobacco uh, opportunity is very good because uh, it makes those people uh, with the different la layers of culture get to connect with each other. Uh, and I'm very much interested in that. And one of the things I'm trying always to incorporate or to add is to talk about culture and particularly Arabic culture, not just Arab American culture, but culture from uh, Arabic speaking countries that go back to uh, decades ago, centuries ago, and that are happening right now uh, because a lot of people living over here and it, it, it are not uh, in touch with that. And uh, some of those who are in touch with that are uh, really interested in reconnecting. So I think culture, as we mentioned earlier, uh, in addition to this opportunity of uh, collaborating and exchange, uh, can help bridge all those gaps. Yeah, I hope this helps answer your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, I had a quick question for the same professor. Uh, watching your slide yeah. on in Michigan uh, has brought me a lot of nostalgia. I grew up in the Netherlands and uh, spent a lot of summers in France where the uh, population of Middle Eastern is about 80% of the school I went to. I, I grew up with mostly refugees, uh, Somalia, Morocco, Turkey, Kurdistan. They, they were all in my class and, and we were all very close. We still are very close today, so it was very uh, nice to see that, that connection that I was able to make with you. So I wanted awesome. to know, you, you mentioned earlier your father is taking you to many countries um, within the Middle Eastern and North African region. Were you aware of the uh, population of, of those people in Europe as well and the strong culture that they have within Europe? Yes, uh, especially in Morocco because Morocco has a very strong French or Francophone culture. Uh, so when I was in, uh, in Morocco, actually a lot of people would speak French even in the streets. And uh, I mean, I, the school I went to was teaching us French uh, from day one. So I, I started learning French. I mean, I forgot a lot of it, but I mean, I'm still practicing more. Uh, um, I'm better at reading uh, than at speaking. Uh, so I was very much aware of that. I'm also uh, a graphic novel like artist. So I'm very interested, very much in bande dessinée or uh, French comic books or Belgian, uh, Franco-Belgian comics. Uh, and I've been to France briefly as well. So I'm uh, very much aware of uh, the presence of uh, Arab uh, culture and Arabs in Europe and in France in particular. And I found this very interesting. I mean, at some point I would love to do some kind of comparison between how Arabic communities, Arabic speaking communities in Europe differ from Arabic speaking communities in the United States because uh, there are similarities, but I'm sure there are a lot of differences uh, that some of that would be uh, going back to the, maybe the colonialist nature of the relationship, uh, particularly for first generation uh, immigrants from Arabic speaking countries to Europe, but also uh, a, a different kind of relationship to the United States recently, uh, economic aspects, language, and so on. So uh, you, you, what you're asking is a very important question. It really sort of expands our view uh, of Arab, some people refer to it as Arab diaspora, I mean, um, and, or just Arab migration. And uh, I've recently uh, published a book on Arab immigration literature, uh, and try to sort of write a counter narrative uh, of how uh, migration is always seen as migration to only to the north, which is uh, the title of a famous Sudanese novel, uh, Caesar of Migration to the North. Uh, and there is a, a lot of literature written in Arabic about migration to London and Paris. I mean, actually most of the novels about immigration were uh, to England and to France for a very long time. It's only recently that uh, stories or novels of immigration uh, started touching upon, upon the United States. And there is uh, migration within the global south. So immigration from uh, Arab countries to African countries. Uh, there, are, there is a Yemeni novel, for instance, that discusses immigration from Yemen to Ethiopia. Uh, and then more recently, because of uh, petrodollars, uh, because of oil producing countries, there is internal movement from North African Arabic speaking countries to Gulf Arabic speaking countries. Uh, so the way the Arab uh, populations or Arab communities outside their home countries uh, disperse and live uh, and uh, prosper and interact with other cultures is a very interesting topic. And yeah, thank you for sharing that and for starting the conversation. Ooh. I would love to reconnect if you want to email me or, or anyone. Oh, there's no end to <laughs> the interesting things we learn, in ter especially that uh, you are an into graphic novels, and I I'm a big Tintin fan, so. <laughs> An asterisk. You and, I, you and I need to have a, a separate Zoom meeting or something. Exactly. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for being here. It was really, it was great. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, Sam, we miss you a lot here, okay? <laughs>
Thank you, Jamil. Yes, of course. Right. So, yeah, I miss you. You are the Maybe next, we should actually next candidate for Nobel Prize of Arabic literature. <laughs> <laughs> Take my boat. <laughs> Thank you, Jamil. Yeah, I mean, if I get that, I'll share the money. Yeah. <laughs> Just... <laughs> A very special thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for this. Thank you, Jimmy. You're doing great. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much to all of our panelists right. joining you, us thank internationally you. via thank Zoom you. and in person. I deeply, deeply appreciate it. The the gratitude is is I'm so it's I'm speechless. This is <laughs> literally out of sci-fi and it is absolutely fantastic. As we close out the semester too, I want to make sure that we give a special shout out to everyone that works at the Office of Global Learning that makes global learning on campus and especially these TTRs uh, possible. So our assistant director, Yanni Simone, our program manager, Sherry Beeson, who has been bravely manning that Zoom today. <laughs> our senior program coordinator, Greg Anderson, our graduate assistant, Anna Prado, and our executive director, Hilary Landorf, and our partners at the New York Times and Education. All of this could not be done without them. So a very special thank you to them. It was very nice to see you all and we'll see you again fall 2022.